Chapter 20, Part 2 11.30pm I feel so much better now. That was a mammoth call, but I'm so pleased we talked. I felt like a little boy again. She just wanted to know about me, not work, just me. I felt like I was being selfish, but she told me to be so daft. She wanted to know. She was genuinely interested. Again, I realised just how much she meant to me, means to me. This conversation has brought us closer, closer than we've been in years. For half an hour, I just opened up. We laughed and cried, both of us. We promised this was a new start for us, and it genuinely is. Not just words. I need her, and she needs me. Whatever barriers were built up over the last few years, we smashed away in that phone call. I told her how much I loved her. She told me, countless times. Then we talked about sister, Julia, and how I need to keep her close. I promised I would. And then we talked work, the Grimshaw case in particular. It started off as an overview, but she wasn't content with that. She scolded me for not talking about my work more with her. She said she loved the whole mystery and detective thing and never missed an episode of Agatha Christie. I tried to explain about confidentiality and and that the reality was not quite as exciting, but she was having none of it. I did say the current case was the reason I was feeling so down and a major factor for the state I was in, as she put it. She wanted to know more. I was so used to telling the backstory now, but it wasn't something you could skim over in five minutes. So there we were. Over an hour into the call, and I'd just reached the point of my New York experiences. I stopped talking at one point, as there was no sign of life on the other end of the line. I thought she must have fallen asleep. No, son, she reassured me. I'm just crying and taking notes. This gave me a real buzz, knowing how engrossed she was. When I reached the part of the story where I, where I was sat in my hotel room in London, with the time fast approaching midnight... I asked her what she thought. After another long pause, she excitedly said, Ooh, you have me hooked now, son. Where the hell is the bugger? We both started giggling, and for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel like I was on my own. Let me sleep on it, she said. I'll give you a bell in the morning, and we can take it from there. We. I like the sound of that. Lovely. We both agreed that it was getting very late and we'd better both get some sleep. She said it would be a busy day tomorrow. Maybe she knew something I didn't. Other than another trip to Cunard with my tail between my legs, I didn't really know what else I could do. Good night, Mr Diary. I need a a eureka moment, but for now I'll settle for a few hours sleep. 8.15pm 8.15 a.m., sorry. My mother called at 7.15 a.m. I was enjoying a dream at the time of owning a ladies' only gym, and I'm only half uh, half sure I was asleep when she called. Paul, I've had some ideas. Could he have been a member of staff? You said you searched the passenger list. If he was staff, he wouldn't have been on that list. I hadn't thought of that. That was a possibility. He could have been out of work at the time. It would make sense, and I'm sure there were always vacancies appearing for jobs on board ship. She carried on. Also, the ship could have been delayed. It might have been due to sail a day or two before, and only set off on the 15th of March due to bad weather or something. Again, that was a possibility. Weather conditions were a factor for sailing on time. But it was the right ship on the right date. It was unlikely, but it was still possible. She had another idea. Could they simply have missed him? Records from so long ago must have been paper copies, only before being put onto the computer systems much later on. Could you check the paper records instead of relying on computer? That was another point. Many of the passenger records were copied onto the system much later, and some of the records were scans of the original documents. There are bound to be anomalies in the system. The passenger records were sure to be incomplete, from so long ago. It is possible, but if that was the case, that would all but end any trace of Ernie through the passenger trace system. Without that, I would have no forwarding address, 
therefore no housing records, therefore no employment history, therefore no tax records, etc., etc. She was very excited, and I didn't want to burst her bubble. She had clearly spent a lot of time thinking about this, and to be fair, she was thinking more clearly than I was. Her first idea seemed the most plausible. It's quite possible Ernie could have been staff. He was such a sociable bloke. I'm sure he could have made a good impression with any would-be employer. I'll go back to the canard offices with that as my focus. I can always ask about the other ideas Mum suggested if the first option leads to a dead end. If she carries on at this rate, I'll have to start paying her. I told her I would go back into their offices about ten o'clock, but to call in advance out of courtesy. I don't want to overstay my welcome there, but it seemed like my only option. After she hung up, she sent me another message. It said, Don't give up, son. You've come this far. We'll find him. Kiss. 9.45am. Right, Mr Diary, I'm going in. You can come with me this time in case I need to scribble down some notes. I promised Mum I would keep her in the loop if I find anything. She said she'll be sitting by the phone, and I know she isn't joking. I spoke with the same lady again at Cunard as I did when I called earlier. She was very agreeable and helpful. I think I, I think she could sense my desperation. Perhaps I misjudged her, and it was me who was getting frustrated with the whole situation and not her. 10.45am. No luck with the staff idea. Ernie wasn't on that list either. Good shout by Mum, though. Kelly confirmed that staff and passengers would have been on separate lists, but unfortunately, Ernie was not on one of them. The same result for her other theories, too. Even if he had been ill, it would have been recorded, and the ship was on time on the right day. No enforced delays or adverse weather conditions. All seemed in order. As for the missing passenger lists, yes, it was possible, and if Ernie was a victim of such an admin error, there wouldn't be much hope of finding him now. Kelly, the canard staff member with lots of patience, couldn't think of anything else either. We both stared at one another looking for a spark of inspiration, but we seemed to have exhausted every possibility. I thanked her for her time and effort and made my way down to the little coffee shop near Charing Cross Station. Time to call Mum again. 12.45pm Back in the hotel room. Back smiling. Confidence and enthusiasm back too. Mother, you are a bloody genius. I've found him. Kelly found him. Well, Mum, you found him. Rewind, rewind. I called Mum after my coffee with the news. No luck. As I headed back down towards the river, I told her I tried all her ideas, but with no success. I told her, as I walked alongside the set off, that I felt we had reached an end. By the time I was alongside Westminster Abbey, I was telling her that I felt I had let Mr Green down, and I was scared to tell him that our journey had ended in 1965. She said to me, Be yourself, son. Being someone else won't get you anywhere. And then I thought, But it might get you to Southampton. I said goodbye to Mum and turned round. I turned and ran back. I passed Churchill's frowning statue, up Whitehall and around the crowds gathered at the gates of Downing Street. I waved at Nelson on the top of his column, and skirted past the start of the mall and up Coxburgh Street onto Waterloo Place. I turned left at Piccadilly Circus, and I was back on Regent Street. I must have flown by fifty tourist attractions on my mission to get back to the canard offices as quickly as possible. I burst through the doors out of breath and sweating like mad. The security guard just looked at me with a you-again sigh. I asked for Miss Wrightson, and he dutifully called her. She arrived smiling and laughing and asked what I wanted to search for this time. We went back into the same little office and turned on the computer. Daniel Frankenberg, I said. Queen Mary, the 15th of March, 1965. New York to Southampton. Daniel Frankenberg, or as near to that spelling as we can find. And there he was, even spelt correctly. Daniel Frankenberg, aged 36, white male, registered address in the UK, 
4 Winkley Street, Bethnal Green, London, E2. How the hell could I have missed that? It makes total sense. The paperwork he arrived with in the States would have been his identity. In New York, he worked as a cash-in-hand contractor. Then he was a self-employed. His house was rented, no need for a record trail. He was Ernie Grimshaw in America. He was coming back to England. He had to be Daniel again, because Daniel was him. He couldn't threaten Daniel's status, even after all these years. But there he was, in black and white. Kelly must have thought I was crazy. I didn't have time to explain, but I thanked her profusely. The trail is back on. All that self-doubt has disappeared again. The confidence and drive is back, and it's down to one person. Not Ernie, not Daniel, not Kelly. My mum. And she doesn't even know what has happened yet. Just a random phrase that sent my train of thought down obvious tracks. I bloody love you, mum.